I have a couple documents I need to pull up for you all. Welcome to the Advisory Council. So today we have a very specific task before us, which is to take a look at the code of conduct for the REA that was developed in this last year. And Eric has dropped the link to the code of conduct in your chat. I'm also gonna share my screen. So if it's hard for you to pull it up on your device, you'll be able to see it on mine. So let me just go over really quickly the reason why we have a code of conduct. I think it's just good for, and this is what the steering committee and the board decided it's good for organizations to have a code of conduct for when we gather um, under the banner of the organization. So we know what it is we expect from one another in our gatherings, particularly in gatherings like ours where we're talking about very tender subjects like religion and spirituality, formation um, and experiences that are personal and also communal. And we have learned as we've heard President Walker talk about and talk about in, the, in her, um, her talk yesterday evening, we have had incidents at the REA that have really deeply wounded many of us and kind of have left us wondering how do we move on or how do we process when things happen that are violent or wounding to people in the room? And so this is a response to events like this and also something to help shape the way that we, we respond to other incidents in the future. Um, so the REA Code of Conduct you'll see here on my shared screen. You'll see here the, the brief paragraph that describes why it exists, why we have it and what it's for. And you have a link so you can read it um, at your own time as well. The why is here as well. Um, I also want to say that the RA Code of Conduct is not something that is final, final in the terms that once we have it on the website, it's never going to change because we're consistently learning and reframing our values and also deepening and expanding, learning about what it is that we value as a community, as an organization, but also are learning from one another, they will consistently be reshaped, reformed and changed. So it's gonna be revisited annually to take a look at what needs, what language needs to change for instance. So as we shift and change, this will also shift and change and it's just an expectation. There's a request in the chat to try to make the text larger if you can. Sure, absolutely. See how large it will, okay, hopefully that helps. Okay, all right. So this is an important paragraph here that establishes what I think um, yesterday Beth in a session was noting the difficult kind of move from scholars to the inclusion of scholar practitioners and to kind of say that, you know, you can be a practitioner and somebody that works in the academy and be part of this organization and how that shift was a difficult one to make. And because they took steps to make that shift, we've also, we've become a more expansive organization and guild. So this paragraph is kind of here to honor that but also to remind us that that's the framework that we come from as part of recognizing who is part of our membership. So as part of that also, we've learned throughout the pandemic that people um, join us from different, different places in their life. And so they're not necessarily leaving their responsibilities to people at home to be with us. So we wanna honor that. And we're not asking them to do that either particularly as we meet online. So there's the code of conduct is divided into two parts. The first part is the general guide for conduct. So this is about just how we gather the positionality that we approach everything from, what we're talking about when we talk about Jedi values. You'll get a chance to discuss this in, in groups as well. And the second part is just an additional guide for what happens online. So there are specific parameters for how we interact with each other in an online space that are gonna be 
in addition to how we would interact with each other in a face-to-face -face space. And these are things that we've learned just from having been online communities in different spaces for a long time. And this last section is about what happens as a response when there is a breach to the code of conduct. So what do we do? Um, and this has been, this is a conversation that we had as a board, but also was kind of uh, bounced out to the advisory council from 2022 to ask about this process. So we adopted a process called the circle process as a pedagogy, as a response to a breach of code of conduct. And this is where we are initiating conversation and storytelling to understand and learn from the harm that was caused. And the goal is to both learn from, but restore and repair relationships with one another through that close listening of story. So at the end of today, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this and then I'll garner from you if there's interest in maybe even training to do, to do this as part of our work. Um, on the advisory council. So let me check. Okay, you know, Eric, I think we have enough people in the participants list to do a little breakout and we can have the Tulsa group. I don't know how many are over there in the Tulsa group, but the Tulsa group can be one. Does that work for you, Eric? Sorry, I'm muted. That's uh, okay. Yes, I think, uh, I think that can work. Um, okay, great. I'll, so the Tulsa group, in order to be your own breakout, just don't accept the um, invitation to breakouts. Um, so. All right. I'm going to stop sharing right now because I want to get to the questions for our breakout groups. We're going to be in breakout groups in a couple of different rounds. And this is so that we can get some feedback for the document that you see before you. And I'm really glad that there are folks in here that have historically been part of the REA much longer than I have. And then also people that are new, because I think that wealth of experiences will help us really figure out if we've hit the mark with this code of conduct. So I'm gonna put some questions in the chat here. So for this first round of conversation in your small groups, you're gonna have 15 minutes. And if you would have somebody take good notes so that when you come back to the large group and we talk about your responses to the questions that um, I can take good notes for the board. So the two questions are this, in your time at the REA, how have we conducted life together in ways that have harmed? It's very expansive and speak from your perspective and your own experience. And then next in your time at the REA, how have we conducted life together in ways that have made you feel seen and recognized? And if you are first, the first timer at REA, you can speak about your experience here this year. And you can also speak about experiences perhaps in other guilds or other frameworks that are like this, where you felt seen and recognized, or you felt, you know, harmed, and things that you you just kind of want organizations to respond to regarding your experience. Any questions about this first round of questions in the process? So make sure to have one note taker, and we will come back, and we will share and process together what we heard. In my classroom, when that happens, when you know people get cut off on Zoom because I teach at a Christian seminary, we say like, "Oh, we were raptured." <laughs> <laughs> Zoom raptured. <laughs> Yesterday, I was driving for some of these. Today, Josh is driving, so he can't see the screen very well. Oh, okay. We hope he can't see the screen. We hope he's looking at the road. <laughs> That's right. Let me just get my participant list up on the side here to make sure. Okay. All right. So let's uh, talk and just report back about what we heard from our group. How many groups did we have, Eric? Two? Well, three. Tulsa was a group, so three. Okay. Great. I'm going to invite Tulsa to speak into the room and share their responses to question one and two. Hi, from Tulsa. Hi. <laughs> 
For a while you were on mute. So I was like, can someone say something so we can make sure that we can actually hear you? <laughs> Please speak a little bit more. <laughs> oh, yes. So we, yes, we would like to hear from the Tulsa group about some of your responses to the question. Okay. Trying to put it into the chat. Um, Patricia is putting it into the chat at the moment. Okay, perfect. Oh, so we will, we'll wait for that and then we'll jump to another group. Okay. <laughs> Diane, do you want to, um, is, is your group ready to share? I don't know who took notes. Sure. I tried to take some notes. So Great. Um, I think our approach to the two questions were sort of thinking about the experiences. And so if it's it, to be seen is not to be harmed. So we sort of approached the questions almost together when we spoke about mm -hmm. them. Um, mm -hmm. So one of them is um, just a, a recognition of um, somebody raised about something, somebody raised the, the concern about the academia perpetuating norms and powers and how does mm -hmm. that happen in the REA and sort of spaces also to challenge that is I think something we're concerned we're concerned about. And then another was about um being conscious of the claims one makes and how that can be excluding like the implications of what I say can not outrightly exclude someone, but the implications do. So that was something that came up. And then it was mainly about really inclusivity. Thanks. Of inclusivity about creating spaces and how people are engaged in different ways. So maybe it's not just presenting papers and getting feedback. That's the usual format. Maybe we can engage other means such as visual means or other ways to engage us in our learning and how we know. Is it and and then just like yeah. finally, um, I I raised this. Uh, there was this question raised too about. Um, I'll just talk about this as myself since I was the one saying this itself. So, as as a younger scholar, I, I hope I'm not just listened to but also engaged because it's through that engagement that I can grow as a scholar, and so that's something I'm hoping to have more through the RAA. Mm -hmm. So, just just that. Yeah. Did I miss anything, group members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was really good. Thank you so much. Um, and if you, this is actually very good, and it gives us a chance to go back to the um, code of conduct later and see how precise we were about what you're talking about, especially in the idea of creating spaces for people that are beyond um, the academic norming, right? So people to be seen and heard in ways, um, in, in the fullness of what they bring, right, as part of their work beyond just writing a paper. I think that that's really important. Um, and is there, oh, that it was just our group after that, I believe. Josh, did you have a different group? Or did you have something you wanted to add? I was in Diane's group, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. All right, so our group, um, Vaughn, did you want to share from our group? I did not make any notes, so um, oh, I thought okay. you were writing some things down, so. I was, I was, but I didn't want to, you know, be the sole voice of our group if you wanted to say something. We'll so add to it group, if you need. Okay, sounds good. So add to it if I missed anything. So our group discussed the first question about um, when were times that we kind of have felt wounded or harmed. And we talked a little bit about our different experiences of REA um, in earlier years, having been more, when it was apt-free, more of a clicky experience where it was like, if you knew people, you knew people. And if you didn't, it was really hard to get to know people or to get to get inside a group or connected. Um, and then we, there was conversation about how REA was a little bit different in that it hosted these banquets and luncheons and gatherings that were very invitational, even to new people and new scholars. So there were opportunities to join. Um, at the same time, we also talked about how, especially as new members of REA and, and new students or new practitioners, that it was there was a great quote about 
feeling like a fish out of water and even the wrong kind of fish. So this feeling that, um, I love that quote, Vaughn said it. it, was really great. I think this idea that, you know, even if you're doing all the right things, and even if you are a member and you're there, that there's kind of a culture and a way of, be, of being at REA that isn't always part of one's culture at home um, or part of how one talks about one's work, especially if you're a practitioner coming into a space that is actually very still explicitly academic. Right? So uh, we also talked about how the value or the highest value at REA still explicitly and implicitly tends to be how we present ourselves to the academy. So through papers and presentations and how that really needs to be deconstructed and interrogated if we're really gonna be truly inclusive. Um, and it goes back to what Diane was talking about and what I've heard in previous groups, which is, do we really need to continually uphold some of these academic norms if we're moving towards something else? We also talked about how um, in the past, but maybe even currently, REA is culturally very Western and North American. So the ways in which other people around the world and other cultures socialize is not necessarily the way that REA tends to socialize, even if we are a more global facing organization. So how do we embrace different types of ways in which we socialize? So I brought up the example of how um, as an Asian person, a Korean person, the way that we're socialized to meet sort of our elders in community or senior scholars is that we're introduced by the elders in our community to other people. There is a pathway that's kind of marked and you're guided through that process. But in a lot of academic circles, including REA, it may just be, you have to tap somebody on the shoulder, right? Which is completely outside the cultural norms of your own community. And so it's, it's that much harder for people who are coming from those perspectives. Did I miss anything, group? Oh, for question two, um, there was a really good point about how Part of being seen and recognized is about giving people a chance to engage what you're doing, engaging your work. And it goes back again to Diane's group of how do we do that if the only avenue that we've created is through papers? So what's the, what are other ways that we can give people opportunities, particularly new people, for us to engage their passion and their work? Um, one point was made about making mistakes is not when making mistakes at REA or um, being, the, being the person that causes the, causes the harm does not necessarily mean you have to leave, that we have tried to make it a practice of that is restorative, that is conversational, that is dialogical and invitational to talk about the things that have happened, even if it takes years to kind of bring that conversation into fruition. Um, another point was made that uh, it's important that REA leadership, particularly board members, reach out to membership. And also it's noticed when they're not seen and visible at our gathering. I think that that's a very important point. All right. Thank you all. Any other comments for the good of the room? I see Tulsa here has put in. Uh, uh, does someone from Tulsa want to read this or would you like me to read it at last? It. You can do it. We have unmuted. Um, okay, you, you go ahead. Ready. That's awesome. I put it in the chat. Um, yeah. Having it said <laughs> out loud is awesome too. So if you like. So I will so, summarize. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, as it's uh, in the chat, I'll just go through the points, and then if somebody else from the group wants to add, we can we can do that. Um, for the first question, uh, we talked about how people in the REA have been thoughtful and have owned uh, their mistakes and um, just the, the collegiality and feeling of trust that has been um, fostered in the past um, opens up a space for asking questions and also making amends um, when mistakes are made so that we can move forward um, as a guild. Um, the leadership has been open to reevaluating their structures, um, especially um, after the 2018 um, uh, conference. 
Um, and then there's a specific, um, Monique had mentioned um, and has mentioned in the past as well that she feels as an outsider, as a European, it has been hard um, as a person who English is not their first language, um, uh, that even in the online spaces, um, the conversations tend to move very quickly. And so, um, you know, sometimes it, uh, if there's a moment where we can check in and make sure that people are following the conversation, maybe speak slower, um, things like that. Uh, and also uh, there's a, maybe a reluctance to share things in the comments because it takes more time to write them down in another language um, there's also um, fear that it, it's going to be written in um, mistakes, grammar mistakes and spelling mistakes. Um, and so also how do we make room for that? Um, how do we also account for the invisible voices, those who have concerns and, and are fear, fearful of sharing those concerns to the group? Um, so we also have to be mindful to always ask those questions. Who is not in the room? What voices have we not heard? And having spaces where we can um, uh, create uh, um, a space where people can share safely. Um, so the second question, um, uh, we talked about how REA has operated very much like, like other academic guilds. Um, uh, upholding the status quo, um, also uh, enacting um, racist um, um, structures. Uh, but one of the things that is different about the REA in the last few years is that the association has owned its, um, its mistakes and is making a concerted effort to listen to its membership and radically change those structures. Um, so really valuing the voices that have not been heard in the past. Anybody else want to add from our group? You do an awesome job. Yeah. Thank you, you so much, Patricia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to call on Paulus because he was in our group but didn't get a chance to share his answer to question two, which is about being seen and heard. So Paulus, if you're there, do you want to add? Uh, I think that, uh, as well as that I share in our group. Uh, I'm Indonesian. Uh, I know that my English is not good like American, British. So maybe I have uh, any fault in English. But uh, in this moment, in era a meeting or discussion, I feel I get inclusion because we are Indonesian, can share anything that experience from Indonesian. So we can make uh, LRE uh, become rich uh, with dialogues, uh, idea, or discussion about many things of religious education. Uh, when I talk about time uh, in Indonesia evening in United morning, I think it's okay because uh, this is a part of how to uh, meet the time. I think it's okay. Uh, and participants can choose what time that we can attend the, uh, attend the discussion. So maybe uh, I'm Indonesian, not follow all of the uh, meeting. Uh, I can choose uh, what meeting. Uh, I think it's okay. And uh, I think that we can uh, appreciate about uh, the committee of RIA 2023, Mary Hess, Kristin Hong, extra work hard. Lakisha, work hard uh, how to uh, this meeting can be held and open access for all scholars in all places in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Paulus. I'm going to move us to the second round of breakouts. And this one is about creativity and imagination and also fear and anxiety. So here are the questions. Tell us that you're going to be your own group again. And then this next group is going to be mixed up or the, the groups that are still online, like we're gonna be mixed up. So the questions are, in your time at REA, how have we conducted life together fearfully and with anxiety? And this is really about naming that. What are those fears and anxieties that we hold? And it's gonna be different depending on what our positionality is within the guild, right? Whether we're students, whether we're practitioners, whether we're um, scholars who've been here for a long time. So how have we conducted life together fearfully and with anxiety? And two, in your time at REA, 
how have we conducted life together with curiosity and imagination? Are you going to put so, those? Yeah. Oh, yes, I will put them in the chat. I just have to talk to that here. There we go. And we'll have 15 minutes once again to be in groups to discuss. And if someone would take notes to report back, that would be great. All right, y'all, welcome back. We're going to report back. Um, and just so you all know, we have about 29 minutes left in our meeting time. This is all going to help me report back to the steering committee and to the board what nuances we need to shift around in the code of conduct um, to make sure that we capture all of this. But also, all of this data, what you're giving us, helps us set the agenda for our JEDI values and goals in, 20, in this next year. So from now until July, what will be important for us to continue to shift around systemically and structurally and how we look at framing the next conference as well. Um, so that's what all of this is going toward. And this has been really helpful, particularly for me as I think about writing the next draft of this code of conduct. Okay. Let's report back. Dory, does your group want to report back? Does somebody want to report back? I will. Joshua just pointed at me. We had a helpful conversation. Um, we talked about the uh, kind of new default mechanism that we were all um, uh, white in this breakout group. Um, and we talked about the sort of new default mechanism we have of pausing to think about what we're gonna say and how it might affect the people in the room and how that can cause fear and anxiety. But then we also talked about how important it is to have buddies of accountability, people that we know who have deep immersion in um, the life of a trans woman, for example, so that if that's gonna be something that comes up in our session or in our leadership, we have a buddy we can talk through with uh, to make sure we are uh, you know, within the parameters of hospitality in the right sorts of way. And then we also talked about the code of conduct and um, how thorough it is and you know how glad we are. One of my comments was looking back 50 years from now, if I were to be reading the records of what REA spent its time doing during this meeting, I think, wow, that was very thoughtful. They were shifting culture. Uh, they're mo we are modeling the way we would hope guilds would be behaving, and we know they're not all behaving that way. So that was um, a sense of imagination. And you know, I think we're approaching this time in our life as a guild with great curiosity. What? How much richer and better are we going to be because we have really radically um, considered how to be hospitable? Hmm. Thank you. Those are really great insights. Yeah, it is. It's sort of, um, I know that as we were writing the code of conduct, it was really just kind of like, where, what's the guild that we want to be part of? And how do we describe that in terms of how we engage one another and how we want to be engaged? So definitely that was an important question we asked. Um, Tulsa, go ahead and if, if, it's help, if it's easier for you to write it in the chat, you could do that or someone could just share from the floor. While you're doing that, um, I'll call on our group. And I wrote notes for our group. So we talked about the fear and anxiety piece. <clears throat> okay, great. Thanks, Monique. Um, for us, Again, naming 2008, not all of us were there at the 2018 gathering and not all of us knew what happened, um, nor is there like a desire to, you know, revisit that over and over again, but we wanted to mark that as, yes, that was a significant turning point and kind of a very eye-opening event that continues to be in the room with us when we think about what we want to be and how we want to be with one another. Um, we also talked about how different social conflicts that are geographically situated in particular parts of the world, especially the US, tend to kind of navigate the conversations at our gatherings and how, whether or not that's helpful or not, like this happens in other guilds as well. This happens at AAR. And one way that that does show up for us as REA is we do have a, a committee on global and local statement making. So this group 
kind of their sole responsibility is to make statements on behalf of the REA board and, our, and to our membership and, and by our membership. And one of the questions that keeps coming up as this committee makes statements is what do we make statements about? How do we pick and choose which situations, which climates, which geographies, which conflicts that we speak out about? And when we speak out about one, there are certainly six or seven that don't get spoken out about. So thinking about that, right? Um, and that's consistently something that I know that committee wrestles with and the board wrestles with as well. Um, we talked about imagination and um, creativity. So there was a helpful noting of how this current way that we think and imagine about a global guilt that's thinking about our shared world and our shared commitments across the world was actually, it's not something that's entirely new. It was actually seeded very, very early on as part of REA and AFRI's history of becoming an interreligious guild, which was not something that was being done <clears throat> in other religious spaces um, or North American spaces. So there was always this sort of, how do we focus on becoming and including scholars and practitioners across the world. And we're now in 2023, seeing the fruition of those early questions. And I think that's a really good way to honor the history of our, our guild and organization. And maybe that needs to make it into the code, right? So that's something to think about. Um, another good question was how does the REA shift its perspective of instead of asking people outside of North America to come alongside what REA names as what's important or the issue, how do, does REA then shift its position to say how to, to ask the question of its membership that's global? How do we come alongside of what you're already doing where you are? So reversing that question as part of our agenda and our work. How do we also balance the different needs that scholars have and practitioners have and give people a chance to be involved in different opportunities based on the different needs that each of these groups have in our work as a guild? So moving towards inclusion <laughs> practitioners, how do we do that without also um, without also reducing opportunities, especially for young scholars, to be able to do the work that they need to do to be part of a guild and part of the academy. So how do we balance those two things? I think that's a core question that we're constantly asking. And also the comment that creativity and imagination comes naturally as a side effect along with global connection. So if we're lacking in curiosity, if we're lacking in imagination, that global connection actually strategically um, engages that right away in our work with one another. So let's see, Tulsa. Patricia, do you wanna um, read this for us? Thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, I just wrote quickly uh, some of the um, things that we talked about. So for the first um, question, um, some of the responses were that there's um, this feeling of desperation when we come to the REA um, to see ourselves in a particular light as scholars. Um, and many of us are the only RE scholar in our institution. And um, you know, many of our colleagues often don't know what exactly it is that we do. So there's this anxiety um, that is projected into the REA that is this anxiety of um, you know, the, the work that we do in our institutions to um, to um, help others understand what we're doing, right? What it is that we do. Um, and so, um, let's see, we, uh, we're constantly asking uh, or, or telling ourselves that we are, um, we are scholarly um, and that we, um, um, that, that we can, we, we do the same, that we do the, the work that other, um, other guilds do, right? That we, we come to this guild and we, and we uh, want to project ourselves as scholars. But, you know, what does it mean to look at scholarly work in a much broader um, lens? Um, 
So other than just writing essays and presenting, um, can we value, you know, things like art? Can we value art for art's sake, right, without having to explain, um, you know, all of the intricacies of meaning making that goes into presenting uh, an art piece? Um, what does well, okay, so what, what does it mean to be scholarly and live a life of the mind in a broad, broad sense? Um, so we bring those anxieties, like I said, the anxiety of always having to project our worth in our institutions, we bring that anxiety um, to our presentations in, in the guild. Um, and one, one thing that was also mentioned is this idea that, you know, because we are a, a global or international organization, um, that we also learn, you know, this idea of like posters, um, maybe in, in Europe and in other spaces, um, institutions uh, value that. You can put that on your CV, but in the US that is not necessarily the case. So how do we also um, uh, value that um, in the US context um, if our institutions don't quite know what a poster is? Um, so in the imagination, um, how do we live a life of imagination and curiosity together as a guild? Um, one of the positive things about being online um, that we talked about is that, you know, there is this idea that, um, uh, that this practice that often uh, women or, or people of color are interrupted in in-person spaces in these conferences. Um, but in the online space, we can we can take a pause, we can formulate a full idea, we can write it in the chat, we can have um, a moment where we can engage each other in the chat and, and respond, you know, fully without being interrupted. Some people have um, uh, feel maybe feel more more heard in that space, or um, they feel that they can they can uh, contribute more fully in that space. Um, yeah. Anybody else want to share? And then you did an awesome job. Perfect. <laughs> really good conversation. So thank you. Yeah. I think that's wow. I actually didn't even think about that, but then about the comment about um, people of color, but also women being interrupted in, in different contexts. Maybe because I just I honestly have experienced that as par for the course, right? Being in the body that I mean. And yes, that is not something that I've experienced in this space because we've gathered online. But it happens when we present every now and then. It does, Again, it does. It still does, even in our own online sessions here. Yes. So it's really interesting to focus on that, yeah. And that might be something that needs to be explicitly included in the on yes. online conduct, right? Yeah, thank you for all that work in that, yeah. I mean, I think what, it, what we're opening up is the different options right so this zoom meeting if you want to banter back and forth you can but if you take a minute realizing that at least within american culture taking a minute to gather your thoughts mean that somebody else is going to talk right <laughs> but if you want to do that in the chat and take your time um, nobody is going to interrupt you in the chat right um, so that, so that there are just, as educators, we can appreciate that people learn and process differently and the more options we can give, the better. <laughs> I think that's great. And I know that, um, there are moderation and facilitation guides, but I think, I think that what you're indicating is that it would be helpful to have that embedded in the code. So this is not just how we, this is just how we should conduct ourselves online. So it's just a, Let's just integrate it as part of this, this code of conduct. That's really helpful. I, could, I would also add the role of silence mm -hmm. and learning. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is something that, that you can, that we should expect um, to have. The yes. people need that, that, that they need that moment to reflect, to make meaning, whatever. And we don't allow it often. Right. I really hesitate to answer quickly because then the silence is gone or right. that's what we do. And that's something I find very hard with online conferences also like ours, that when it's done, it's done and you're in your own silence, but that's reflection time could be. But often you get 
especially when I'm not in a room as I am right now, when I'm at home, then I think, oh, I can do the dishes now, or I can get the kids, or you're, you're out of that complete sacred space that you provide together. And that's something we, it's not only RA, it's, it's all in online working, hybrid working, education as well. How can you make it sensing and having that silence without thinking, yeah, this is awkward. We have to do something. It has to be worth it that we are sitting here online or it costing internet or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's really something searching for globally, I think, how to do that well. Yeah. I think that's, and it is hard in how to do that in online spaces. And we like to blame the online space for not being able to cultivate silence. But I think what you're pointing to is that culturally, many of us just haven't been able to do it in our real lives. Right. Exactly. So what makes so let's make a difference. Let's That's make nice. a difference. Yeah. <laughs> what makes us think that suddenly being in an online space is going to, and having a mute button is going to make us. <laughs> so, yeah, I think um, reminding ourselves that it's not, our skills can transfer to online spaces, but so do our lack of certain skills. Mm -hmm. So I think being explicit about that is really, really important. Um, yeah. What else? What else is in the room in terms of? And by room, I mean in at Tulsa, but also this green room that we need to kind of capture part of our what's important in this code of conduct to pull out or to add. Don't get the question really right. So I'll repeat that question again. Um, What's important, what else is important to capture as part of the notes from this advisory council to the board and membership about what, what, is, what should be part of this code of conduct, what should be nuanced more, et cetera. Anything that we didn't kind of capture in conversation. Uh, I would just say, Christine, uh, it's one thing to kind of glance through the document and it's another to actually study it and take it apart and say how to improve this, that, and the other thing. Uh, so I'm certainly not prepared <clears throat> to uh, make any suggestions at this point. But uh, if there were some formal way of uh, providing opportunity uh, let's say step one study the document step two uh, suggest changes or additions or omissions or whatever in a, a fairly formal process rather than as i say just kind of doing it off the cuff as i would have to do right now yes so what will happen is um I will take your notes to the steering committee and they will help in the revision of nuancing of what you currently have. What you currently have is our code of conduct. So it's not suspended in any way until we're, it's never quite final because we're always gonna be revisiting it and making sure that it, it lives into the values that we have. But what we'll do is take the information that you've given us and look at it and make sure it, um, that we are addressing all of the concerns and points that you've made. And if not, that we're making additions or uh, making edits, then what we'll do is email you all as the advisory board for this year's REA with the draft that we have revised and ask for your comments there. And we will um, incorporate those before the new version or the edited version is uploaded. So that was our process last year. And it will be our process. This it just tends to be easier. Meanwhile, if you need to connect with me about it um, on your own, you can always email me, and I'll post that in the chat at the end of our, our meeting today. And you can always email me for a conversation over Zoom or just over email is fine. Uh, before we have about ten minutes left, is there anything um, else that you would like me to grab in our notes? I put this in the chat, Christine, but um, I just say it out loud. 
I really did um, want to just underline what you said about this has been this it this does feel like we're living into the aspirations of the people who set the agenda for REA a long, long time ago. I've always been, you know, more hopeful for more international uh, participation, more global participation, more, um, you know, every time there's been authentic interfaith uh, panel, you know, my heart has been singing. So I'm just grateful that that this is part of, I hope that there'll be a way to frame the, the code of conduct, not as a reaction to, but as an ongoing living into who we are. And I also love what you just said, as the, you know, co-program chair for next year, I feel like we're prototyping it. And we'll, you know, we're gonna, I'm just gonna keep looking at it and remembering like, how could we, how could we actually make this a living human document that, that helps us in the design of everything that we do, form and content. Absolutely. I mean, all of us have been at institutions, um, academic and religious, that have written things like this, and they sit, just sit on a website. Exactly. Um, so the work is, this is sort of our accountability document to are we living into it, which is why we have to revisit it. Um, it this is not the work. This is the blueprint for the work. Um, I want to move us quickly to, in the few minutes that we have left, to the circle process, because um, one of the one of the things that we want to engage as a board this year is training individuals that are part of our membership to facilitate circle processes as they are um, as we're invited to be part of them. So as people bring them up and say we would love for our REA to come in uh, facilitate a circle process among our membership. We would love to have people that we could send out to do this work over online or in person as necessary. Um, and so I would want to kind of gauge, is there any interest in training to do some of that work? Or is it something that you feel that whoever the Jedi officer is for the REA at that time, that that person should be the person doing that work? So shared work is always more fun, but it also comes with more shared responsibility. And since we're just trying this out, I wonder what your opinion is on that. Yes, Annie. And I would like you to be part of the work. That would be great. Um, and I and you don't have to be, you know, like you can be anybody as long as you're a member of the REA, right? Whatever your role is in your community, that's fine. I think that um, sharing that would be great. So what I'll do is think about it um, and then we will probably put a call out to see if there's any interest in gathering a small group of us that would be willing to be trained probably by someone who's, who's facilitated these before. Shared work, yes, agree. There's a comment about using emojis to boost people. Some emojis are, just, yes, absolutely, Eileen. I'm gonna make a note of that. That's just a, a side thing. I, I think that you would find that in the organization, there's already a bunch of people who've been trained in circle process. Yes. I have, we're going to, at BU, it was a big, the religion and conflict transformation was a big part of the Tom, sorry, the Tom Porter Center for Religion and Conflict Transformation. It was a big part of what it does. Um, I think David Cho might have a role in that now. Okay. Um, I've been trained in circle process. Um, Kelly Keith Perry, I think, has. Yes. At least his wife has. Um, so, I mean, I think you could pull the group and find that there's already a fair amount of training in it. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe our, our place is different than everybody else. Um, but Judith, uh, Judith Olson, who's, um, may she rest in peace. Her funeral is Saturday. I'm sorry, her celebration of life is Saturday. Um, she was at Gordon Conwell before that. So some of them may have been tra um, trained by Judith. So I just, you know, it's, I, although it may be new in our group, in, in REA, I think you'll find that there's a fair amount of um, experience out there inside REA. Yeah. Or, or maybe I'm all wet. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think the question is, how do we train new people um, to, to be able to facilitate this that are kind of dispersed in different areas? 
who are comfortable doing it online and also in person. Um, and then also among the people who are already doing this and facilitating, who would be interested in doing it on behalf of our group. So I think that that, and that's great. Eileen, would you mind if I tapped you for some of these names individually and contacts? That would be awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that, that'd be fine. Okay. Just write that up here. And Annie, I've written your name down. Because I think that's our next step is being prepared for any of the asks that we get. I also wanted to build in something. The reason why I think um, my personal hesitancy to have the Jedi officer be the only one doing it is because sometimes a Jedi officer might get called into a circle process. So whoever that person is, right? Um, and you want, you want there to be a, a framework of accountability for officers too. Okay. Okay, right, we're almost at time. Um, I just wanted to open the floor for any other things that you would like to share. There's a feedback form in the chat. I'd like to pick up on something that came from the Tulsa group, and that is the dominance of uh, academic, uh, either research, uh, primarily research, in the, uh, especially the online meetings. And uh, I'm just recalling uh, the subtitle of REA, which is it's a, an association of professors, practitioners, and researchers in religious education. And there was an attempt on the part of the Religious Education Association before the merger in the early 2000s to include things like workshops in the annual meeting. <clears throat> Um, so it wasn't focused, some, some sessions were also multiple sessions occurring at the same time, giving people options to uh, do different things uh, that would otherwise might be a, a dull time or a dead time for them during the meeting. Uh, that's very difficult, it seems to me, uh, both of those, the uh, multiple sessions at one time and the adoption or the inclusion of actual workshops, practical workshops related to religious education. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not sure how that works uh, online. It works uh, quite well in an in-person conference. So it's, it's something to keep in mind because it it encourages inclusion of those who otherwise might, uh, because of what they do, uh, feel kind of an outsider inside what is essentially an academic group or researchers. I think that's a good, I feel like we tried that a couple of years ago, having tandem workshops or sessions where people could self-select. I think we might have done it that first year that we were fully online. But it's something for um, the program chairs, Rodoria and Wanda, and also this planning program committee to consider and think about what might be possible. I think choice is a really, I mean, that's part of the foundational ways in which we teach. I think that's a good insight. Thank you, Noel. We are at time now. I wanna thank you all for being part of this conversation today and congratulations and welcome to the advisory committee for REA for this next year. So we will be um, in contact with you and you will also see that new draft of the code of conduct pop back into your inbox and your email. Um, Eric, do we have a, a, a list of everyone who attended today? Um, we have taken a screenshot of the participants list, but it, people come in and out. So hopefully we caught everyone. Great, thank you so much. I wanna thank you for your time today and just yeah, I mean, let's go forward with this work. I'm really excited about it. Thank you thanks, all. Thanks to That's you, Christine. You've all been so awesome. I wish I was there in person with you.